Okay, sure. So um, maybe we can do an introduction first. Like um, maybe I will start first. So <laughs> I think I have seen John is closing his mirror and then open again. So so my name is Yi Xing. I'm actually the moderator for this seminar. So I I am a Canberra SCM staff and I have been joining the ASCM since last year. So it's really a lovely place. Yeah. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> so Robin, do you want to do the next? Sure. All right. Thanks, Yishen. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I'm just really pleased to be able to um, sh uh, share this uh, conversation. It's a, it's a topic that I've been interested in for a long time. I've, I've been a, a senior friend of the student Christian movement um, here in Canberra for uh, for many years and before that a, a member of the SCM and um, the uh, uh, I, I think I, I know everyone who's on here quite well but uh, just for the uh, for the recording um, I uh, uh, worked for a long time with Australia's overseas aid program and I studied philosophy at, at university so and I have have had a long interest in the relationship between philosophy and theology and uh, in terms of a scientific understanding of theology and uh, so that's the the background that I'll be bringing to the talk today so I just go from my camera it's nice coming to Andy and Rose yeah, that's good. Yeah. can everyone hear us uh, yeah so I'm Ross. Um, no longer a student, was a few years ago, uh, senior friend now in the student Christian movement. Um, I'm quite excited about today's talk. I grew up in a household where we've got one, one parent who's quite literal in the interpretation of the Bible and, and one parent who's kind of agnostic, I'm not really sure what, he doesn't like to define it, um, who's interested in astronomy. So I spent my childhood going along to um, the local astronomy group in country WA and observing the sky and then lots of discussions over the table about Bishop Usher, 7,000 years, um, all the stuff that I'm guessing Robbie's gonna be talking about today. I did invite my dad to come along today, but he had a Shearer's reunion, Robbie, so I apologize, but I'm here. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. My name is Andy. Um, my background is accountant. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Peter, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh. Hello. Uh, I have been a Christian since the age of about uh, 11, uh, an announced Christian. And uh, I went off and joined the Navy as an officer and served for 34 years. After that, I joined the public service and uh, am still with the public service uh, with defence. Um, my interest in space and science has been ongoing since I was just a little kid. Uh, my, uh, my master's degree is in project management and uh, I will say that uh, to a man with a hammer everything is a nail and in my case a project. Uh, but uh, looking at space has always been something that I have done. As a junior naval officer, I navigated by the stars, uh, and um, and I still know how to do that kind of celestial navigation. There we go. Interesting. I just mentioned Peter and I are, are good friends from Quebec Uniting Church. Oh, thank you. Just down the road from us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Peter. Uh, Rado, are you here? Uh, are you seeing? Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Silves, I'm Silves, uh, I'm from Eastimor, I'm studying in the uh, CIT, Cambridge Institute of the Technology, I'm doing for the community development. Uh, I'm one of the staff uh, ACM in the Canberra. Okay, thank you. Thank you. John? Hi, I'm John. I, I'm, I'm, I'm joining you guys from Newcastle, which is north of Sydney. And I'm a senior friend and sit on the National Committee 
Yeah, I have to say, I don't know anything about astronomy and the Bible, even though I, I studied theology. So I'm really excited and curious. The only interest I had about astronomy is about falling stars. Because someone told me that falling stars were angels coming down to Earth. The same <laughs> like that. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your thoughts, Robbie, and, and your ideas and your research finding. Yeah. Right. Thanks for having me. I always make a wish when I see a falling star. Thank you. Um, Casey, are you here? Casey? Hi, everyone. I'm Kathy. Can you hear? Yes. Hi, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, I moved from Brisbane to Canberra. I'm now working as an accountant. Uh, I actually don't have much no much no knowledge about astronomy that's my friend in invite inviting me to hear uh what i really uh, interested in it yeah and uh, very nice to see you today thank you that's all thank you welcome all right well perhaps i'll uh, move on with the uh, with the discussion uh, so, uh, first, uh, thank you very much, Yi Shin and uh, Australian Student Christian Movement for hosting this. It's material that I've been working on for about 30 years. So I just had a, a research interest in the uh, astronomical uh, underpinnings of uh, biblical theology, which is, it's actually quite a controversial uh, topic. There's a lot of, of different views on it. So. Uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, go to share screen and um, I'd just like to um, thank uh, Yi Shin for, uh, for this poster, which, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the telescope in, in the poster uh, is how we think of astronomy these days, that, uh, but in the ancient world, they, uh, they had no telescopes. And uh, so astronomy was only what people could see with their naked eye. And uh, so I'm going to go through um, a series of um, uh, slides, which will uh, just go through some of the uh, astronomical ideas in the Bible. And the, the beginning is uh, in Genesis with, uh, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night let them be for signs and for seasons for days and years now um, and uh, the sun and god made the sun and the moon and, and set them in the sky now this theme of let them be for signs and for seasons is actually very important because in the ancient world uh, everybody relied on uh, agriculture and they relied on viewing the uh, the stars of the sky to uh, to know when to plant and when to uh, when to reap and so uh, the stars uh, showed them the uh, the seasons and um, the uh, the next theme that i want to bring bring out there are several psalms which really emphasize the presence of god the grandeur of god the uh, wonder of the heavens, just the, how awesome the heavens. So God, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Now here we, we see the understanding of the magnitude of the heavens. And uh, this idea that the fingers of God have placed the uh, stars and, and planets uh, in place, and the uh, how what a, a remarkable thing it is in this uh, complex, fragile universe that we live in, that God has care for human beings. So this is the. Uh, the underpinning of the importance of astronomy for the Bible, just that the, the heavens, the visible heavens, are the, uh, 
the manifestation of God. And the, the great thing about the heavens is that the stars are always, always seem to be the same. And so here in, in this picture, uh, this is a picture of, uh, well, the zodiac constellations surrounding the, the North Celestial Pole and, uh, and the Milky Way. But I'll just continue with uh, a couple of the, uh, the biblical texts. Uh, a second psalm is Psalm 19. Uh, again, it's a it's a famous psalm because it uh, it reflects this sense of the presence of God in the heavens. And it's not to say that God is the same as nature, but that God is manifest in nature. So the stability, the order, the perfection of the stars is a sign of uh, the attributes of God. So the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. So this idea that the heavens are pouring forth forth speech is this sense that there's a uh, an underlying order again this this theme of order complexity uh, rationality it comes up in um, in Paul's epistle to the Colossians where uh, where he says that uh, that Christ is uh, the uh, the manifestation of cosmic order so this idea of the logos how everything is connected to everything else through Christ underpins the uh, the importance of the uh, observation of the heavens uh, for uh, for theology. And Job has another famous line about astronomy. He asks, "Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades?" And you see, this is a picture of the beautiful global glo globular cluster, the Pleiades. Um, which uh, is a, it's in the zodiac, it's at the shoulder of the bull, Taurus. Um, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loosen the belt of Orion? I've added a, a picture of as the belt of Orion. Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons? So once again, this theme that uh, the agricultural community relied on seeing the constellations rise in their seasons or lead out the bear and their cubs. Of course, in the North, Northern Hemisphere, the bear is the greatest constellation. Do you know the laws of the heavens? Now, we're, we're still only gradually learning the laws of the heavens in modern astronomy and uh, dark matter, dark energy, black holes, such great mysteries. Just, it's only a hundred years ago that people uh, discovered that the universe was bigger than just the Milky Way galaxy. And now uh, the, the scale of the, uh, the universe is just unimaginable. And can you set their dominion over the earth? Uh, it's this question of how the, the law that governs the heavens is the same law that governs the earth, which became the inspiration for Sir Isaac Newton with the theory of gravity, saying that whereas the, the assumption had been that the heavens are perfect and orderly while earth is corrupted and disorderly. But Newton proved that the same law of gravity applies on earth as in heaven. And there we have on earth as in heaven, the line from the Lord's prayer, which is uh, such an important theme for, for understanding the vision of uh, the, uh, the goals of religion that, may the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. So may the perfection, the order, the stability, the eternity that we see in the stars come to express itself in our community, in our life here on earth, which is so fractured and corrupted and broken. So now I'm going to get into the more controversial dimension of astronomy in the, in the Bible, because there's a lot of material in the New Testament which appears to have an astronomical basis, but uh, which is 
what we could call a parable. So, for example, when Jesus said, tells his disciples uh, as they're uh, uh, preparing for the Last Supper, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Now, there's a an esoteric tradition that is a secret tradition, which says that this this whole statement about the the Last Supper and the upper room is a parable. That is, it's saying that the the salvation of the world is about transforming the world to achieve the stability and order that we see uh, manifest in the heavens so god may be present on earth and this motif of the man carrying the jar of water uh, when we when we think of the um the zodiac constellations of course this constellation aquarius is the man carrying the jar of water and so the idea that this that the city represents the the heavens that the holy city is the heavenly jerusalem visible above us in the sky and it's it's looking if this brings up a a really complex um point in terms of astronomy which is known as the procession of the equinox and as uh, was mentioned in the uh, uh the publicity for the talk there's a theory in the ancient church which was held by most of the early church theologians that time was 7000 years long that is time began with the uh, the creation of the garden of eden and adam and eve and uh, and then uh there would be 6000 years of the fall from grace followed by the return of jesus christ for a thousand years of peace followed by a uh, a shift to some sort of new order at which has not really been explained but it's like that this 7000 year period is is what under, is understood as the passage of time so what uh, to to help illustrate uh, before uh, uh, I'll show you an, an animated uh, diagram of that seven thousand year period. But before doing that, I want to um, continue with the theme of the symbolic uh, presence of the heavens in the in the biblical text. So this text from the, uh, the very last chapter of the Bible, the, the 22nd chapter of the Revelation. It begins, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healings of the nations. Now, the interpretation that uh, struck me in reading this verse was that the uh, this picture that I've uh, that I've got here uh, shows the Milky Way down the middle of the picture and the zodiac constellations on either side. So what we have is the very old uh, understanding of the milky way visible uh, striding across the the night sky as the river of life clear as a crystal and uh, from the throne of god and down the mid the and picking up on this earlier interpretation of the heavenly jerusalem the great city as an allegory for the vision of the night sky the star the starry sky and then on each side of this river there stands a tree. Now, there are no real trees grow on both sides of a river. A tree grows on one, one side or the other side of a river, but this is a tree that grows on both sides of a river and it's got one fruit for each month, which is an, 
in my view, is an exact symbol for the relationship between these 12 constellations of the zodiac, which are just the, the constellations that the sun passes through each year. So the sun uh, appears in one of these constellations each month. So one fruit for each month. And uh, so it's this theme of when we understand the heavens, then we are on a path of healing. So I'll, I'll go back to this um, discussion of the, um, the 7,000 years of time. And I'll look to the uh, a different diagram, which is, let's see where I'll find. Just Sorry to interrupt. I just want to welcome Guo Yu, and she's doing a master of computing in ANU. Okay. So, um, uh, welcome. So yeah. here we have uh, this uh, this same diagram that I was uh, just showing to you. So I hope uh, now if I start this moving, can you see that moving? Is it moving or just still? Sorry, can anyone? Uh, so John is saying it's moving. And so what we started off with was um, what this diagram shows. The, the diagonal yellow line is the path of the sun and through the, and through the zodiac constellations. And the horizontal white line is the celestial equator, which separates the North Hemisphere and from the, the South Hemisphere. So when the sun is in the South Hemisphere, then it's in the spring and summer seasons um, for us here in Australia. And it's the um, autumn and winter seasons for the North. And of course, conversely, when the sun uh, moves to the north of the equator, as we know, it's spring and summer for the north and autumn and winter for the south. Now, the, 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 because of the orbit of the earth has a, has a wobble, which takes about 26,000 years. And what that means is that the position in the stars where the sun shifts from the south hemisphere at the March equinox into the North Hemisphere, it's gradually moving backward through the stars. So with this diagram, as we can see here, we're back around 4000 BC, which conventionally was the uh, theory of the, the timing of the Garden of Eden. So the, the idea in conventional young earth creationism was that um, it was back when the, uh, the spring equinox was in the constellation of Taurus, that was the, the time of Adam and, and Noah and moving on to, to Abraham. So as the, so what I, I, I've set the clock ticking. So now, as you can see, we're just moving forward very rapidly and uh, through the, the constellation of Taurus, uh, takes 2,000 years for the equinox point to travel through one constellation. And there's a whole series of images in the Bible, like the golden calf and um, the, the idea of the, uh, the Lamb of God as the uh, equinox point moves into Aries. And then, uh, as you can see, I'm just going to stop the clock here, which is around the time of the biblical prophets. So here we are about 600 BC. Now, my contention, my hypothesis, is that the biblical prophets were well aware of this visual astronomy. They knew how to calculate the position of the equinox as uh, they were in communication with the great astronomical civilizations in Babylon and uh, Egypt, and they could see that there was this line of stars 
which the spring point, that is the, the, the beginning of the year, um, the, the Passover, it's essentially Passover, Easter, uh, the, the beginning of spring, that this point would, continue, would cross this horizontal line of stars in uh, uh, several hundred years of years time. And so that's a theme that comes through, for example, in the prophet Daniel, where he says it will be 70 weeks until the coming of the Messiah. So there was this association between the position of the spring point crossing into a new age across this line that would mark a messianic transformation of the world. And so as we, as we just continue, we see that when the, uh, the spring point reached the first fish of, of Pisces, then that's the time that we understand as the turning point of time from before Christ to Anno Domini. So we set this, we use this time to set our calendar uh, to say, that um, the alpha and omega point, so it's the beginning and the end, uh, it's in astronomical terms, it's because Aries is understood as the first sign of the zodiac and Pisces as the last sign of the zodiac. This is the, the beginning and, and end of from, from one zodiac age to the next zodiac age, from one great year to the next great year. So it has this sort of cosmic um, I think Robbie is, has been there's some connection problem. So, oh yeah. Well okay. Okay, yeah. Um, and oh we heard to uh, cosmic something or other. We have this cosmic Go on. Right. Um, okay. I'll just uh, change my screen. Just give me a minute. Mm -hmm. right. So. Um, so let's see. Uh, excuse me. I'm just having a bit of. With the, um, so so what I've done, I just need to so just having a bit of difficulty with with this. Um, so um, I'm just trying to change the. Um, screen that I'm showing you, but it's just not cooperating. So I just need to go to new share and um, here we are. Okay, that's, I just needed to do it in the right order. And what we have here, I hope you can see, uh, this is a um, depiction of the sky as it was in 21 AD, which was precisely the time when the um, spring point crossed the first fish of Pisces. Now, what it what occurs to me in terms of this um, uh, this depiction is that this um, X in the sky is something that was understood in Greek philosophy by Plato as, uh, as the symbol of the order of the heavens. And when this X, which is formed by the path of the sun and the celestial equator, crossed the, the first fish of, of Pisces, it, um, it formed a shape which to my view is very similar to uh, it's it symbolizes the nativity of christ that is the, the incarnation of of god uh, on earth but 
so as well as the nativity, it, it symbolizes the whole passion of Christ. That is the messianic work of Christ in transforming the planet. And surprisingly enough, it has a very direct resemblance to the traditional Christian symbol known as the Cairo cross, which brings in the alpha and, and, and omega symbols, the beginning and the end, and has this um, X, um, the, chi, the little letter chi, crossing the rho, this P-shaped letter, which are conventionally, they're the first two letters of the name of Christ, um, but they also have this symbolic appearance of corresponding to the um, the vision of the heavens at the time of Christ. So going back to the um, uh, the movement of the uh, heavens through the the constellation. So here we we'd reached the um, beginning of the zodiac age of Pisces, and then as we continue the movement, you can see over the last two thousand years the zodiac point has been moving through the constellation of Pisces until um, it uh, reaches. This is the second fish, and here we are. We're just coming up to the. Um, we'll just. There we are. That's the that's the position of the equinox today, and we can see that for the next hundred or so years, the equinox point will continue to move through the constellation of Pisces before entering the constellation of Aquarius, and this is what is conventionally understood as the zodiac age of Aquarius which of course has uh, a whole lot of um, cultural connection. And the, the interesting thing about the 7,000 year theory of time, assuming that the originators of that theory saw it against the framework of this understanding of um, the visual astronomy of the, the precession of the equinox, they could see that the, the first age of Christianity corresponds to the age of Pisces, and then that the conventional theory of the second coming of Jesus Christ corresponds to the dawn of the age of Aquarius. So you have this, um, that then provides a framework to say, how do we understand this um, symbolism? And how do we uh, interpret how uh, this um, transformation of the world will, uh, will occur? And my approach to these questions is uh, as much as possible to try to be scientific and to say that this is the, the scientific underpinning and yet we can imagine in it a need to uh, to see that the old prediction was that the uh, presence of Christ in the world would take on a whole new dimension, a transformative dimension, a new heaven and new earth at the second coming. And so all of these themes around the second coming, I think I'd like to try to um, leave out any sort of supernatural interpretation and just interpret them in a purely natural way to say, uh, here we have a great vision of how the uh, message of Christ calls for the transformation of our world. 
And so we see this call for transformation in the, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, where in verse in chapter 24, uh, he says, the, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole inhabited earth, and then the end will come. And then in chapter 25, he explains the nature of that end, where he says that the, um, in the parable of the last judgment, that the criterion for salvation is, did you perform works of mercy? Did you feed the hungry? Uh, and give drink to the thirsty? Did you visit sick people and prisoners? Did you uh, um, give uh, shelter to the homeless and uh, welcome strangers? Uh, did you give clothes to the naked? And most important, the, the one instruction that brings all of these things together, did you treat the least of the world as though they were Jesus Christ? And it, it's a profound um, theological statement about the uh, purpose of Christian faith. So there we are. Um, now I'm just thinking I'll, I'd like to close with, with one um, further um, provocative um, piece of, uh, of information. And, um, and that is, that there's an intriguing line in the Bible that this is in Revelation 12, that a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on, a, on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. Now, this is a, a, a depiction of the sky in Jerusalem at Passover in the year 5 BC. And uh, the, uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, at that on that date, there was a um, lunar eclipse, a total eclipse of the moon, which meant that as the moon rose in Jerusalem, it was blood red. And uh, the the extraordinary thing was that for the last two thousand years, the uh, the Passover had always happened when the uh, the full moon was in Libra, but now for the first time ever, and because it was an eclipse, they could see that this was the exact point of the of the full moon. The uh, the the moon was at the foot of the woman. And to me, this is a quite plausible symbol of a new age, that people could see that the, the old age where the Passover happened in the constellation of Libra had shifted and that their thinking equally needed to shift. Now, there are many other uh, examples within the New Testament that I could uh, continue with which would continue this theme of a concealed astronomical vision uh, within uh, the Bible. The part of the problem is that this material is quite hard for um, ordinary people to understand. And one of the themes, things about ancient religion was that it was held among a, um, a group of um, uh, initiated people and so these sorts of themes would have been kept as a close secret but uh, they would have been conveyed to the general public in parable and so Jesus says to you the initiates I, um, I teach the secrets of the kingdom of God but to everyone else to the general public I only speak in parables and so this is, uh, so I feel that we're invited to say, what were these secrets of the kingdom that Jesus uh, explained to his initiated followers? And looking at these sorts of themes around astronomy seems to me to be a, uh, a really good way to 
tell a coherent story about the underlying meaning of uh, the Gospels. I'll uh, conclude at that point and just open up for uh, questions and conversations and comments. That's great. Thanks, Robbie. Yes, thanks all. So I've got a few questions, but I'm happy to wait um, if someone else wants to ask first or I can go just... for it, Roz. Okay. Uh, first question was um, uh, like I've I've heard that around the time that um, Jesus was active, there are also quite a few other um, people essentially seen as prophets with like large followings. Um, with lots of lots of attention at the time because of this idea that there was a new age coming. Um, but I guess I'm curious, do you, do you know off the top of your head when these prophecies about a Messiah actually started? Did, did they only start during the Babylonian captivity when suddenly um, Jewish scholars were exposed to astrology and astronomy i don't want to put them in the same basket but but thinking along those lines or are they are they earlier john might know as well with the background of theology, but. well my view is that it does go back a long way earlier and especially in india and uh, the uh, the interesting thing is that the indian cosmology uh, has a concept that they call the yuga which is a cycle, an eternal cycle between golden ages and iron ages. And so the golden age of wisdom and light and the iron age of ignorance and darkness. And that theme of uh, the, the original idea was that this cycle took 24,000 years. And so from the last golden age to the depth of the iron age was 12,000 years. And the theory was that uh, Jesus came at the time of the depth of the Iron Age. So in a sense, he represented the spirit of the Golden Age in the midst of the Iron Age. And uh, so the, the resurrection means that the mentality of the Iron Age cannot kill the spirit of the Golden Age because that's, uh, that's who Jesus represents. So uh, that's a much older idea, which flowed through into uh, a range of Western stories, like the um, uh, statue, Daniel's story of the, um, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar with the uh, statue with the head of gold and, and f uh, feet of iron mixed with clay and body of silver and trunk of, of bronze. So this cycle of uh, gold, silver, iron, uh, bronze, iron, and then back up through bronze, silver, up to gold again, came through into Western mythology with um, the uh, a whole lot of Greek and Roman myths about the descent from a golden age into an iron age. And then this Indian idea that once you reach the bottom of the iron age, then you start to rise again. That what I find really fascinating is that that has an exact match to what actually happens scientifically. There's a, a climate uh, study known as the Milankovitch cycles, which is the basically the mainstream understanding of, of the orbital dynamics of natural climate change before we started to muck it up with our carbon dioxide emissions. And uh, what that natural cycle involves is this, exactly this uh, roughly 24,000 year cycle of light and dark between ice age between ice age maximum and and minimum and so in india like people came from africa to india about eighty thousand years ago people had lived through um, several of these twenty thousand year cycles now it's very hard to imagine that people could have figured out something so slow um, but uh, they it's it's a remarkable um, coincidence i suppose that that the the mythology exactly matches the science and so so anyway you've got this all of these ideas coming together as you mentioned Roz, with um the anticipation of a new age coming 
uh, at the time when the equinox crossed into the from the the ram into the fish and that uh, becoming a, a symbolic idea it's it's fascinating in the um, Jewish war and the antiquities of the Jews the which are the main historical texts outside of the Bible that we have on the uh, the history of the period there are many as you say messianic figures but Jesus Christ doesn't get mentioned at all except for a a line which is which is written in the language of the fourth century <laughs> so um, there's there's a lot of contro controversy around uh, the actual history but i i take the view let's just stick to what it means to us in symbolic terms and uh, rather than what actually happened necessarily is the most important thing but again uh, the roman poet virgil in his uh, Georgics, he said that the Messiah of the New Age was um, the Emperor Augustus. So um, we we have, uh, as you say, uh, this widespread uh, vision of of a New Age uh, led by uh, a messianic figure. Robbie, I was interested in seeing the uh, some of the names of the smaller constellations or the other constellations and oh. for instance you've got Cetus C-E-T-U-S as the whale uh, that's and, right yes and whales and dolphins and so forth are called the cetaceans uh, as a as a type of animal so there you have a name a quite ancient name that is uh, carrying through into the uh, into the naming of the uh, of the constellations the other thing I will say is, can I just can I just comment on the on yep. the the Cetus line because uh, this is something that had occurred to me that the um, uh, Jonah, of course, spent three days in the belly of the whale, yes. and uh, and so um, one of the themes is that the sun, when it reaches the winter solstice stops moving on the horizon for three days and then starts moving again so this is another uh, astronomical theme here we it's surprising that the cetus is right uh, adjacent to the uh, the march equinox and uh, so it certainly occurred to me how much of the jonah story may have had some uh, astronomical um, reference as well so thanks peter that's i'm glad you mentioned that one <laughs> well it was a curiosity it just it jumped out at me the other thing i will say is to those of us who who did practical astro navigation in our youth um the naming of the constellations bears absolutely no interest i've got to say you're, you're more interested in the navigational stars than you are in the uh, the constellations. Where to find them? I couldn't care less. I, I just got to know where they were in the sky. So uh, there's a list, the, the, the old list of navi navigable stars, they are called. There are 57 of them. Have a look in Wikipedia, if you like, or wherever, and you'll find the names of the navigable stars. And... Uh, the they're the ones which you pick from if you are going to do navigation because they give you various choices of angles which allow you to pinpoint your place uh, on the earth's surface and um, by using a fairly simple kind of navigation tool that would divide um, into the degrees and so forth you can work out where you are and of course, the other interesting one is why we have 60 seconds in a day and why we, sorry, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour and 24 hours in the day. That's and right. my understanding is that uh, there was one of the ancient civilizations which used a base 60 as Babylon. Its, uh, Babylon in, there you go. Instead of base 10 or whatever, I mean, 10 fingers and thumbs as opposed to Babylon using 60. It's a bit like, uh, you know, why do we have uh, gauges of, uh, of railways 
It's to do with how two horses were able to be uh, yoked uh, in ancient Rome. And so all of these things go way back. It's so true. And this theme of why we have a, a sexagesimal um, counting system for angles uh, in, in astronomy and uh, for measuring time, it's got a remarkable link to this whole procession of the equinox story because the conventional estimate of the period of a zodiac age is 2,160 years, which is six times six times six times 10. So, so you've got this um, 60 um, base uh, number in the structure of time in the 2,160 estimate. Now the actual period is 2,148 years. Uh, so it's a little bit, uh, that, that conventional estimate was a little bit wrong, but for, for the ancients, it was very difficult to, uh, to measure it more precisely. And so uh, like, I think it's fantastic that we, that I've been able to use this um, Skygazer um, software to just measure um, the timing so precisely. So, so when I um, say, for example, that the uh, the equinox crossed the first fish of Pisces on the uh, the sixteenth of September in the year twenty one AD, that's uh, that's a, a a very precise measurement according to the Skygazer software. Now, whether the software is accurate, I'm not one hundred percent certain, but I I suspect it is. And uh, yeah, uh, it, uh, because it, like the great thing is that you know, modern astronomy has just developed such a magnificent understanding of the mechanics of the solar system. And then, then the question is, how do we combine this mechanical understanding with the spiritual wisdom that was um, the uh, underpinning of the of the ancient approach to the heavens. That's right, and it's it's possible, as you mentioned earlier, it's possible to look at the uh, the various angles uh, in relation to the stars and the sun and so forth of ancient uh, um, uh, ceremonial places, and be able to say they were built in a, at a certain time because now we can go back and work out exactly what the alignment was at a particular sort of year or within a couple of years and say, that's when they must have been built. Yep. There's quite a bit of, uh, of academic uh, study being done on this in the last, oh, I'd say four or five years because I've been reading academic papers on exactly that subject. This is one of my favourite books on this topic. It's, yep. um, it's called The Dawn of by uh, and what's it called? A, a study of temple worship and mythology of the ancient Egyptians by Norman Lockyer. Yep. Uh, Norman, Norman Lockyer, he uh, founded the journal Nature and he discovered helium. So he's quite a major scientist. And uh, but so his interest in this topic of, of Egyptian temple worship was something that his scientific friends found a bit embarrassing because it's a bit of a um, unusual. Uh, interest and yet he uh he uh, it's it's a remarkable book because he show he proves that what the egyptians did was that they built their temples to point to a spot on the horizon where a star was going to rise like sirius or canopus or one of the bright stars then the the light from that star would flow through the temple entranceway and light up a jewel in the sanctuary. Herodotus explains that this is what they did. Uh, and uh, But every few hundred years, because of this wobble of the axis of the earth, causing the procession of the equinox, the, the temple would stop working. And so what they did was that they would completely demolish the temple and rebuild it on a new alignment. So, uh, you know, 10,000 years ago, Sirius in, in Egypt rose near the southern horizon and now it, it rises near the eastern horizon. So they, they had to, the temples that were devoted to, um, to the star Sirius had to uh, be reconstructed every few hundred years 
to uh, uh, th uh, to match yep. that motion. Thanks, Peter. Yes. Now, John, do you have any questions? I just want to Thanks. make two, two comments, uh, and, yep. and they might be points of interest. Um, that Indian astronomy is incredibly precise, uh, but I think that's by and large known now all across the world that how precise they were in around setting the names and things like that. But what I want to say is the words, the Sanskrit and Bengali words, um, most people in India will say Bengali speaking word, they would innately know those words, but actual meaning they wouldn't know. But when you put it to the science, it's like it explains those sound, those words have actual meaning in the outer space kind of sense. Right. So that's one comment. So somehow the knowledge has been lost, but the language still carries it. You know, what yes. I want, yeah. the other thing I want to say is around, you know, one of the Old Testament reading, it's said about the stars, they, they put forth the speech. Yes. Now, the, in, in John's gospel, uh, speech is or sound is synonymous with, with, with God or the creator. So, uh, and that's why Christ becomes logos. So Christ is the logos. So, and, and Jesus is the Christ and the Christ is the God and God and man at the same time. Just that's, that's in relation to commenting on what Ross was saying that, you know, where did, the Messiah idea come from. I think people, I don't think, but there are references and they can be checked out. Like almost all peoples of the earth have had some, some sense of, throughout the history, had some sense of desire for a Messiah, someone to come and rescue them. So whether that is in the form of hero or whether that, that is in some form of godly figure so that idea was pervasive across cultures um and it was definitely much more pervasive in much more sophisticated cultures that's not to say in a discriminatory sense but in the sense that cultures that drove pursuit of knowledge and wisdom and mathematics and scientific foundation all, all the sort of things so but the interesting thing is that the coming of the messiah or someone to redeem or save is closely associated with the stars uh, and one example is uh, when the persians came the zoroastrians came those who we know as kings when jesus was born you know, they were following a star. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's a simple language uh, that's used in the biblical description to describe. But actually, they were as astronomers. Well, they were wise men. And one of the reasons they were wise men is that they had knowledge in astronomy. It's safe to assume that. And people who were astronomers, they were not only astronomers, but they were also mathematicians and, and scientists. So, and therefore, the, and, and because with any science, as you know, that science is, is a, a kind of block of knowledge that not only references itself or puts forward a theory and then goes out to trial that or research that and find the, find the out outcome. But science also cross refers across the, the streams of knowledge. You know, so someone who was an astronomer where had to be also a wise man in say scriptures or ancient myths or poetry. Um, so I guess the reason I'm saying comment making that tying that comment around Messiah is that but the desire for Messiah from cultures is from an utilitarian point of view. And utilitarian point of view is that you know, they're suffering and, you know, there must be something beyond this horrible, miserable life that we have. You know, what's the point? You know, we, we are born, we're raised, we eat food, we, 
we get married, we have children, we become kings, and then what? What happens? You know, this we 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 can't seem to free ourselves from the inevitable death or disease or loss of a loved one. So that crisis kind of triggers ontological crisis and then drove collectively a desire for Messiah. And therefore Messiah is never a figure that comes out of the people, but from outside through the intervention of the gods. So Hercules or or the Greek gods and goddesses who are half human now, things like that. So I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is that that kind of because the idea of coming of messiah is so utilitarian that it's almost archetypal kind of need or desire but at the same time it's so improbable that for a human to become a savior is almost impossible so all the messiahs are not only humans but also gods so krishna for example in in hindu faith or indian myth is is god himself Brahma. So, um, but the Jewish culture, Jewish tradition still expects Jesus to come, you know, and this. Or the, the Messiah to come, but. Messiah, Messiah to come. So, and this astronomical expectations surrounding it, you know, there will be, there will be earthquakes and things like that, and that sort of idea. So, um, I guess I see, I see why my comment would be that i see why early church might have been quite exclusive about it early church communities were very exclusive because some of this knowledge is esoteric and one of the reasons why it's esoteric is because knowledge can be dangerous the risk of someone becoming dr foster's is much higher than someone becoming a sage or a saved humble monastic or ascetic persons because because when you acquire this sort of knowledge it, it 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 brings ego with it and when ego comes ego comes to the back door it's like the snake in the garden of eden it whispers that uh that you are powerful because you are powerful because we are children of god we you know uh, jesus says that you know ask anything in the name of myself so if i can do this if i can raise the dead if i can heal the liver you can too and part of it is not technology part of it is 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 being of course there there might be other stuff associated with it but when someone acquires that kind of power and and ego flows with it then you become frankenstein or you risk run the risk of becoming frankenstein so there might be more more curse than blessings for the person for the individual and people around him so that's you know that could that that could be one of the reasons why it was a surgery and it was oh and i think it's so important for us to open up this sort of conversation about you know what's the meaning of uh, messianic understanding in um in the ancient world so for example, one one theme, I think that your point about how you know messianic visions uh, came through came arose more in advanced civilizations than in um, I suppose isolated uh, uh, tribal communities, and and that's partly because the I think the scale of war and suffering at the um, civilizational level is is higher. And so, you know, the need, this sense that the world is on a path to destruction, and and needs a a transformation of thinking, um, is much much greater. And so, when you when you consider the um, uh, the Jesus story um, as uh, as one that um, and sorry, I'm uh, just uh, looking at these uh, chat comments. Um, the um, the problem is that uh, going back to this point that there was a an esoteric community, a a wisdom community, who 
um, put together the knowledge which found its way into the Gospels, but that the Gospels represent a popular explanation, uh, that they're, they're a public version of what originated as secret teachings. But then the, uh, the political context of Christianity, this need to build a mass movement and to confront the Roman Empire, uh, meant that uh, that these sorts of um, uh, astronomical interpretations were unwelcome because there's a sense in which this sort of analysis um, diminishes the um, public perception of what a exceptional holy action Jesus has performed like it, it takes the, mir the miraculous, it, it provides a scientific explanation of the miraculous dimension, but the church doesn't want a scientific explanation because it wants to say that all of the miracles are the, are the action of God and they're, they're completely beyond anything that we can understand. So once we start saying, well, maybe we can explain it and understand it, then that becomes a, a, her a heretical statement. So uh, I think that a lot of this sort of analysis that I've been presenting uh, would have been seen as heretical in the, uh, in the early church because it, uh, it takes away from the literal story of Jesus as the son of God. And it, it also, uh, I don't, like, I don't think it uh, diminishes the the glory and wonder of uh, of God, but I do think it uh, it appears to do that from a, a conventional literal um, religious perspective. There are all sorts of multipliers that happen with astronomy. For instance, the Bible talks about. 70 times seven. Seven, why do we have seven days in the week? But let's take 70 times seven. That's 490 days. Uh, if you look at moon cycles, four years of moon cycle, sorry, four 13 cycles become seven years. Four of those 490s become seven years of, of time. All sorts of multipliers go on when you look at this kind of stuff. Of course, the seven days of the week uh, come from the lunar, uh, the phases of the moon. That's right. And which Four drive seven, which which drive the uh, the tides. And so the uh, the tides, the the king tides and the neap tides uh, have are separated by seven days. Yes. And and so uh, you've got this sort of fundamental wave structure of seven, which is, I think, why we have seven days in the week and not eight or nine. Yeah. And then the, the 490, uh, that comes from Daniel's prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, which mm -hmm. um, in, uh, places the, uh, the new age in about the year 27 AD. And uh, so, uh, I mean, my view is that that's, prophecy could easily have been based on this astronomical knowledge because uh, this knowledge is just just comes from visual astronomy uh, they certainly had the scientific knowledge at the time of Daniel in order to calculate that the uh, equinox would enter the uh, the constellation of Pisces in about 27 AD and so the the four the 70 weeks of, of Daniel 9 seems to me to make most sense against that um, an astronomical prophecy rather than a supernatural one. Yes. And <laughs> isn't it amazing that, uh, that we have, uh, dare I say, ladies, the menstrual cycle of 28 days cycling with the moon. And um, it's, it's only recently that, uh, that archaeologists have been finding bones with 28 marks in them. In other words, very, very old uh, menstrual cycle markings that women have been making on something or other 
and then discarding at the end of the month. I just wanted to make a comment around numbers. In the Old Testament, numerology is considered a heresy and also prohibited. And there's a reason why. Um, anyway, it's fascinating discussion, Robbie. Thank you so much. I have to sign out, but it's great to see you all. Well, I think we're just coming. We're just coming to an end. So, uh, Yishin, uh, perhaps if I pass it, pass back to you, and we can um, uh, end our recording and uh, and say goodbye. Yeah, sure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Robbie. I actually invite a one of my friend in China. He's actually doing some research in space, but because she had difficulty in downloading the Zoom, so I'm. <laughs> I really want him to attend, but it's so sad that he couldn't. Did any of the students have questions? Like um, Silphers or Kathy? Yeah, do you, do you guys do have questions? <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, so... Well, yeah. just once again, thanks everyone so much for um, uh, coming along and I, I hope you got something out of the discussion and uh, I look forward to being able to, uh, to share it with others. Thank you. It's been really Thank interesting. You. Thanks. Thank you, Peter.